for something entirely different, which is something that frequently happens in our collections. So I was looking for the answer to a question that was asked to me by one of the uh, classes I was teaching. And I happened to come across this set of letters um, that had led to quite the scandal and much discussion. I had to stop every what everyone was doing so we could all read through the letters and give our input. And we hope that you will enjoy these letters as much as we did. My PowerPoint's frozen. <laughs> So hold on one moment. It's the ghost of Florabelle telling you yeah, what she Flora thinks Bell about this. Yeah, Florabelle doesn't want this to happen. We've had a suspicious many glitches with this presentation. Yeah. There she is. So we've been able to find some information um, about who Florabelle was, primarily um, for her year, early years from newspapers and her high school yearbook. So her name was Florabelle Ellis Brinson, and she lived with her stepfather, mother, and um, two sisters, uh, and later a, a brother in New Bern, North Carolina, which is in eastern North Carolina. Florabelle's father was a vice president of a grocery store. He had completed one year of college, and his mother had graduated from high school. So this was not, uh, Florabelle was going to be the first person in the family, theoretically, to get a four-year degree. So this was going to be a big deal for Florabelle and for the family. Um, and I managed to find a picture of the house they lived in, which um, does show that they were pretty well off. This is the house as it exists today. And um, you can find it online too. It's in the Ghent Historic District <clears throat> of New Bern. Uh, and it actually has a, plow, uh, a plaque on the exterior saying it's the Oscar Brinson House. So Florabelle was from a very well-to-do family. She would have been um, considered a woman of society such as that existed in New Bern, North Carolina. So it was natural that um, when Florabelle came of age, we would find coverage of her in the local New Bern newspapers. So we're, there were several articles about her attending parties or throwing parties for her friends and classmates. Um, so she would have been 15 at the time that these parties were happening. So kind of think of a, a debutante age. Um, these are times, you know, she would have learned the proper, um, her responsibilities and how to interact in formal gatherings. Um, she would have had opportunities outside of school to mingle with boys, which was very important to her, according to her high school yearbook. And um, she would have learned how to be a proper hostess, which would be very important for any woman in the South of a certain class. So we know she was very socially active, according to her high school yearbook. Um, she uh, was not very involved with sports herself, but she supported um, the, the men's sports team, the baseball team. Um, she seemed to fancy herself an opera star early on. She, there's talk of her singing a great deal. Um, she probably wanted to be, you know, like a radio star, like a diva, because that would be you know, the closest famous glamorous lifestyle you could imagine at this point in time. And she would have had an entourage of admirers. So you will see this come out in her personality, but it's definitely that last statement in her description that really we started to notice was consistent with the general trend, which was she seemed to really have no problem finding men who wanted to date her or hang around with her. And the bottom quote is her quote from her senior high school yearbook, um, which she would have been 18 at the time. So she gives, she projects this image of being a, a veteran um, at issues of the heart, uh, shall we say, um, and of course uh, has no problem attracting, attracting young men. So she graduates in 1923 and then comes to our campus uh, in the fall for the fall semester of 1923. So this is roughly what our 
what College Avenue would have looked like at that time. Um, on the left, you have the student, you, the student building and South Spencer a bit farther down. And on the right, you have the Forney building, which was the Carnegie Library and the old Spencer building next to it. Um, so I don't know about comparable buildings in New Bern um, at this time, but because it's a coastal town, there weren't that many high buildings usually. So this prob these probably would have been pretty substantial buildings. Um, unfortunately, we were a women's college, so there were not a lot of men on campus, which was Floribel's issue. So here's a standard day you would expect to see on campus during uh, her first semester. Um, your schedule was pretty full. It was going to be dictated to you as well. We, our students did not have the freedom that students today do. You could not come and go as you please, definitely as a first year student. Um, there were counselors on campus who had to know where you were. You were expected to show up to places in a timely manner, dressed in a certain way and have your dorms ordered in a certain way. Um, but we were, um, the 1922-1923 school year was the first year our campus had exceeded 1,000 students in enrollment. So we were a growing school when she arrived, and certainly it would have been um, a substantial number of students to get along with by her standards. So to begin, um, we find this, uh, these extracts from an SGA trial, essentially, um, listing out the charges against Floribel. And she is also on there with Anna Clark. Anna Clark was a friend of hers in New Bern who came here as well. Um, Anna also threw parties and attended many of the same parties. So it was kind of like coming with, to your school with your best friend. I don't know much about the other student who managed to get in trouble with them, Louise Faulkner, so I'll have to look into that. But certainly Floribel um, seemed to not be setting the best, uh, her, not, her efforts as a role model were not the best. She seemed to be um, having her little click and carrying her little click in all, to all sorts of adventures. So we see a lot of to and writing places with men um, which of course would have been without permission. Um, writing to High Point, which was an, another town entirely, so that would have been considered very far away. Um, and of course, we were all very impressed that she managed to sneak boys into the dining room for supper. That was a pretty major accomplishment. We thought, <clears throat> we're not 100% certain what promiscuous borrowing is, though. We think it might be a lightly worded phrase for stealing, but we're not entirely certain. So to begin, we're going to um, hear the series of letters. You're going to hear um, President Faust, who is read by Beth Ann, um, go back and forth with the parents. You're going to hear um, attorney at law, Romulus Nunn, um, defend Laura as well. He's a family friend. And then you will finally hear from Floribel and you will get to judge for yourself about Floribel's charges. February 14th, 1924, Mr. O.R. Brinson, New Bern, North Carolina. My dear Mr. Brinson, I'm sure your daughter has explained to you fully about her misconduct at the college, but I feel it do you that I write to you about this matter. Your daughter has been giving trouble at the college all year, and she was finally told that the next offense would cause the authorities at the college to request her withdrawal. I cannot explain to you how distressed I feel over the whole situation but I am convinced that she was given every opportunity to make her conduct conform to our regulations. She persistently refused to do this, and we felt that we could not longer be responsible for her when she had shown a determination to disregard our advice and warnings. There was, of course, nothing left for us to do except to send her home. 
I think your daughter has good possibilities if she will only become more thoughtful and discreet. I feel for you more keenly than I can tell you in this unfortunate occurrence, and my sincere hope is that your daughter will be taught a lesson by her sad experience that will greatly benefit her and will in the end make her a good, strong woman. If I can in any way serve you or your daughter, I shall be delighted to do so. With best wishes and kindest regards, I am very sincerely yours, President Julius Faust. So the father then immediately sends a telegraph to President Faust, though we do not have that in our archive. February 19th, 1924, Mr. Oscar R. Brinson, Newburn, North Carolina, my dear Mr. Brinson. I received your telegram on Saturday afternoon after office hours. I intended replying yesterday, but was called out of Greensboro, and for that reason, my reply has been delayed until this morning. I did not write you giving the details of your daughter's misconduct in my first letter, because I always give the student the opportunity to explain these matters to her parents. I am very glad to comply with your request about giving you the information desired. On October 9th, Miss Flora Bell Brinson was before our Senate for discipline. The charges against her at that time were as follows. Number one, riding to and from church with men without permission. Number two, riding to High Point without permission. Number three, repeatedly riding without permission. Number four, when your daughter was faced with these charges, she was not entirely frank and open about them. As you know, Miss Florabelle's mother came to the college, and I understand that she and Miss Florabelle agreed that if there should be any additional misconduct, that your daughter would be requested to leave the college. I am not sure that Mrs. Brinson agreed to this, but I am sure that your daughter agreed to it. Since, since Miss Brinson agreed that any additional misconduct would cause her to be requested to withdraw from the college, she has still been guilty of indiscretions, etc. She has been called before the Student Government Association president and warned of the situation existing. To be more definite, she has violated our regulations in the following manner. Number one, she has met young men without permission and has taken them to our dining room for supper, where the conduct was not only improper, but really boisterous. Number two, she with other students have picked up boys on the way to college from downtown. Number three, she has been late coming to the campus from downtown on several occasions. Number four, she came back from church one Sunday morning with several boys and visited with them, causing her to be late for luncheon. Number five, she has been generally disorderly in the dormitory. I do not think there should be any misunderstanding about these matters because she admitted to me before leaving that her conduct has been far from proper and that really nothing was left for the authorities of the college but to request her to withdraw. I might say in connection with this case that the Student Government Association can only recommend the sending of a student away from the college. I must myself assume the responsibility before it is done. I have this understanding with the students because I am un unwilling to permit immature people to handle a matter so grave. The whole matter has distressed me greatly, and I shall always be glad to do anything I can for your daughter. There are, however, 
certain limitations that I cannot change. As I said in my former letter, I certainly hope this sad experience will be a lesson to Miss Florabelle and that she will make in the end a good, strong woman. Please give her my kindest regards. Very sincerely yours, President Julius Faust. February 21st, 1924. Dear Mr. Faust, I am in receipt of your letters concerning Florabel, for which I thank you, and I can fully appreciate your position in the matter. Mrs. Branson and myself also did go up to the school while Florabel was on campus, but nothing was said to us about withdrawing her should she commit another offense. But that doesn't matter anyway, for she knew the rules and should have kept them right to the dot. It is such a terrible disappointment to me for this thing to happen, for I've always been partial to this school. I had several cousins to attend it years ago. The dear girls and I said if I ever had a girl large enough and was able, I wanted her to attend this school. I have two more coming on besides Florabel, whom I expect to send. Now back to Florabel. She, as you know, had started a business course, which meant four years, so you see, she was just getting started. I know that Mrs. Clark's disappointment is great, but not so great as mine, as Annie was only taking a commercial course, and I understand she is fixing to take a position here now as stenographer, and I'm glad to know she made such progress while in school. Mr. Faust, I'm going to ask you to reconsider the matter and see if you can't give my child one more chance to make good by reinstating her. I'm sure she has now realized what she has done and will make a submissive student. Mrs. Brinson is almost a wreck. She at one time in her life was in bad health, but has been having wonderful health for about 12 years. But I'm afraid this is gonna upset her as she is taking it so hard. She hasn't eaten but very little nor slept much since Florabel came. Please reconsider and advise me that you will give her another chance and I'll appreciate it more than I can express. I'm your O.R. Brinson. February 28th, 1924, Mr. Oscar R. Brinson, New Bern, North Carolina, my dear Mr. Brinson. I owe you an apology for my delay in answering your letter of the 21st instant. I have been so extremely busy during the last few days that I have not had an opportunity to write you. I have studied the matter from every standpoint, and I am sure it is not best for your daughter or the student body for her to be readmitted to the college at once. This whole matter has been most distressing, but I am compelled to do what I think is best, no matter what my sympathies may be. After most mature consideration, I have decided that I will readmit Miss Brinson to the college next fall. When she left the college, I really did not have time to state what my final position would be, but at that time I determined if she should show the right spirit that I would doubtless let her restart next year. This is a matter, however, that she should take up with me if she wishes to be readmitted. Really, her record as a student, not considering her conduct at all, is so unsatisfactory that we should have been justified in sending her home on account of her failure to do the work satisfactorily. If she is willing to take a new start next fall and do the work earnestly, and seriously, I shall be willing and pleased to do all I can to aid her. I hope you will tell her about my decision in this matter and have her to write me if she desires to return at the time indicated. If she should be reinstated, it would be on the express condition that she give no further trouble while a student in the college. I wish to assure you again that you all have my deepest sympathy in this most trying experience. 
With best wishes and kindest regards, I am very sincerely, sincerely yours, President Julius Faust. February 20th, 1924. Mr. J.I. Faust, President, North Carolina College for Women, Greensboro, North Carolina. Dear sir, my friend O.R. Brentson of this city has been to see me about the dismissal of his daughter, Floribel E. Brentson, from your school, not as a client and attorney, but as one man to another. Mr. Brentson and his wife are almost distracted over the situation, and you will, I'm sure, sympathize with them in their humiliation, pain, and sorrow. It's made Mrs. Brentson sick. The young girl is too greatly distressed. I'm writing to ask you if it's possible for this young woman to return to your school, and if so, under what conditions? Please let me hear from you as early as you can, and greatly oblige. Yours truly, Romulus A. Nunn. March 1st, 1924. My dear Dr. Faust, you haven't an idea how distressed and heartbroken I have been over my daughter's conduct and careless matter while at school. I do not and have not censored you, nor the Student Government Association. I feel that I myself am the failure. The one thing I have most desired in life is to be a real mother. Now I am suffering the keenest disappointment I have ever known. Before I felt the pressing responsibility of motherhood, I served my state in the missionary capacity under the auspices of the Christian Women's Board of Missions for a few years. Also, as chairman of the social welfare work for my own department of the Women's Club. Since then, I have put aside everything and devoted my entire time as homemaker for my husband and children. Flora Bell has always been such a sweet, pure-minded girl, and to use her father's words, so many looked up to Flora Bell. You can imagine our agony and distress just now. No agony of heart can be greater than that caused by careless neglect of those we love best. As you know, Dr. Faust, to find understanding friends is like finding hidden treasures. As is always the case, my sorrow has spread like wildfire over the state. Friends have written expressing their sympathy and asking for particulars. I have sent copies of your letter carrying the charges against Floribel at home. I have passed your own copy that they might help me to vindicate her name, which, as you know, is her all in life. Friends come back and say they cannot understand. The penalty seems too great for charges related. Like yourself, my strength is small. In the past, I have suffered with tuberculosis, having had an arrested case for a number of years. I have enjoyed life, but for the past two weeks, my strength seems to have been absorbed by my sorrow. I can scarcely walk and am fighting hard to save myself from a decline. I am not stating this for effect, but as a fact, could you not, for the sake of my child's name, reconsider the sentenced past, which in its nature is so misleading? Can you not give us immediate relief, which is in your power only, by taking Flora Bell back and imposing upon her a different sentence? Give her another chance to make good and prove herself. In the meantime, I shall continue to tell Jesus of my disappointment and my anxiety, my only means employed for the success in this life and ask that your kind, tender, and fatherly heart may be opened to see the seriousness of our situation and help us. Sincerely yours, Mrs. O.R. Brinson. 
March 5th, 1924. Mrs. O.R. Brinson, New Bern, North Carolina. My dear Mrs. Brinson, I have received your letter of the first instant, and I assume that your husband had not received my letter, which I wrote to you last Thursday. In that letter, I stated that I should be willing to reinstate Miss Brinson next fall if she could convince me that she would do her work earnestly and give no further trouble at the college. This is as far as I can go in the matter and at the same time feel that I was doing right. I cannot tell you how deeply I have sympathized with you and Mr. Brinson and also your daughter in this whole matter. I do feel, however, that Miss Brinson is the only one to blame about the unfortunate occurrence. I regret, of course, that she is compelled to suffer for what she did, but really... I have no choice when it comes to doing what I think is right. I am not disposed to censure anyone because I do not feel that I can under the circumstances. But I do, however, feel that in the statement in the last paragraph of your letter is really unjust and unfair. In this statement, you imply, but you do not say so that I am in some way responsible for your suffering and that I can relieve it. I am sure that if you will think calmly and quietly about the matter, you will come to the conclusion that your daughter herself is responsible for your suffering and that I have simply tried to protect her and the college by what I have done. I have no desire whatever to be harsh or rude in what I have stated above, but I do feel that Miss Brinson herself should be made to realize that she has caused all of the trouble and that I cannot in any way be responsible for her acts after she had been warned and had agreed that if she did not conduct herself properly in the future, she would leave the college without protest. I wish to assure you in conclusion that you have and have had my deepest sympathy in all of this trouble. I myself have felt it most keenly. With sincere good wishes, I am very truly yours, President Julius Faust. This is written on Armstrong Grove Street Company Stationery, March 5th, 1924. My dear Dr. Faust, I'm not writing this as a business sort of letter to you, but as a friendly letter. We met only the one time, which was a meeting under very unpleasant circumstances. This, has, this I have regretted so much, for I feel that if I had previously met and talked with you, perhaps I would have been more thoughtful and quite not so careless. But I understand, though, by being president of a college containing 1,400 girls, that you have very little time for private interviews with them. It does seem as if I could have gone up to our state college and remained as a credit to it rather than a discredit, which I have proven to be, yet it's hard for you to believe that I was even the least bit careful in my conduct, naturally after such a result. But I wasn't careful enough, for one can't be too careful, especially a girl. Thoughtlessness and carelessness is so very harmful, and I happen to be one of its many victims. I shouldn't be one of its victims, though. Dr. Faust, I've had one person on earth in the back of me who has done more of her part to cause me to be thoughtful, careful, and above all discreet in my manner always. That person, to me, is the most wonderful of God's beautiful creatures on this earth. She is my mother. Nevertheless, with all that, I have failed this one time, but I am praying to God that she might see my prove myself. She might see me prove myself to her and show my appreciation and gratitude, which I owe so much to my dear mother and father. I am capable of doing this and I shall make it my last deed on earth. Can't you see Dr. Faust what it would mean to me to go back to school this term 
and gather up my broken threads. For next fall seems so long to do that, as these broken threads might be lost in the eyes of so many, many people. This seems so much to ask you, and it's truly hard to do. But as you know, you are the one to ask, and the only one. It lies within your power. We have now suffered an embarrassment, which is indeed very great. But as you know, this is such a misleading thing. I myself have always thought of a girl being sent from college for immoral things. And now I have to suffer the same penalty as those who have let, who had to leave your school for being guilty of such. I'm proud to say to you that I have never done a thing shameful. And my mother is usually the first to know everything I do, for I never keep things from her. This that I have just said perhaps doesn't mean absolutely anything to you, but I just wanted you to know that it means more to me than anything in this world. We only have our name while on this earth, as you know, and when one loses it, we are about gone. Dr. Faust, I wish you would reconsider and tell me that I might enter school again this term. I promise you to work absolutely and taboo the good times. I shall also attend the summer school in order to make up my back work and the unsatisfactory work of the first semester. Then I wouldn't lose my whole freshman year. Otherwise, I shall. I truly hope this isn't asking too much of you, for it means so much to me. And then most of all, to my mother and father. I'm sure you understand, Dr. Faust, and will do whatever you can to help me. I wish to thank you for your kindness in the past and your very nice letters to my father. You have been very considerate. I anxiously await your letter. Very sincerely, Florbelt E. Brinson. March 10th, 1924, Miss Florabel Brinson, New Bern, North Carolina. My dear Miss Brinson, I received your letter several days ago, but have been so very busy that I have not had time to reply until this morning. I wish to say that I am delighted about the attitude you manifest towards the whole situation. I do not feel that anyone who expresses such loyalty and devotion to her mother can do otherwise than succeed ultimately. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you should write as you have along this line. I have, however, gone as far as I can go with reference to readmitting you to the college. I should certainly do anything for you that I can, but I cannot do what you request without being unjust to other students who have had to leave the college under like circumstances. The only thing that has afforded me any comfort in this whole unfortunate matter is the fact that I thought and still think that your experience will ultimately benefit you. Entirely apart from the consideration I mentioned above, it is really best for you to understand once and for all that you cannot be guilty of serious misconduct and have the authorities yield on account of the pleas of yourself and your friends. I am saying this not to cause you any additional trouble or annoyance, but simply to state a fact. I should like to write you quite at length, but I have so many other duties I am compelled to make my letters somewhat short. Please give my kindest regards to your father and mother. With sincere good wishes for yourself, I am very truly yours, President Julius Faust. All right, let's give a hand to our readers. <laughs> All right, so Florabel um, exits the school. She is no longer a member of the school. So uh, naturally, we went on to try to find what had happened to her because we needed an end to the story. Um, so what we found was honestly a little bit sad. So we know after, um, 
after she leaves in 1923, she doesn't go on to any other school as far as we can find. So that was her last attempt at school. We do know she goes to Florida um, in 1926 on a vacation, and she's um, with a lot of women who are probably around her age group who are married. There's a few who aren't. So she's beginning to uh, stick out a little bit here. And uh, her stepsister, Martha, uh, who is her younger stepsister, marries her first hus her husband, and Flora Bell's the maid of honor. So we have the the younger sisters getting married before the eldest sister, which is also a bit suspicious in this time period. By the 1940 census, we see that she's still unmarried and living with her parents in New Bern, but that her half sister Maria. Um, is unmarried still, um, it's her, her younger, her other younger sister, but her Maria has earned a four-year degree um, and became a teacher. She went to an, obviously another school. None of the sisters um, attended the school after Flora Bell's incident. So we have um, the, the younger, one of the younger sisters getting married, the other younger sister has a career. And then we later have also uh, Flora Bell goes with her sister Martha with some relatives to New York. So she's at least traveling around a little bit. She's getting she's getting out some out from New Bern a little bit. But in 1943, her father, who had been sick for a few years now, ends up dying. So uh, my hypothesis is this was a sign she really needed to get married. She needed to find a way to get married. Um, and she does in 1945. Uh, so she was 39 years old when she got married. The average age of marriage for a woman in 1923 was, uh, when I looked it up, was 21 years old. So it was still around that in, 45, in 1945 as well. So this is a very, very old age uh, for a first marriage. And this was her husband, Fred's second marriage. He already had um, two, two daughters uh, before he ended up marrying Flora Bell. So this marriage happened in South Carolina in a very small ceremony. So she, this was not a celebrated marriage, um, but he was at least well off in the community. He was on the other side of the state from New Bern to Hendersonville. So um, my hypothesis is that the, the mother um, in telling everyone under the sun and her her sorrow spreading like wildfire ended up um, basically ruining Flora Bell's chances of marriage and her marriage prospects. And the only person she could find was a person who would be on his second marriage on the other side of the state. So they, uh, they did marry and she moved to Hendersonville and she gave birth to her only child in 46 the next year whose uh, name was Flora Bell Frederick Justice. So she's named, the daughter's named after the mother and father, but she goes by Freddie. She's still alive and lives in Florida, actually. Um, and in 1950, she's still living in Hendersonville. And after her husband dies in 1964, so he was not around for very long in her life, around 10 years or so, we think she ends up moving to Florida at that time. Florabelle's sister ends up dying young as well, um, but I will point out Florabelle's mother, who was on the verge of death in 1923 over the stress from the entire ordeal, doesn't die until 1975 at the age of 92. And Florabelle herself ends up dying in 1983 at the age of 77. She dies in Florida, but she is brought back to the to her husband's family cemetery in Hendersonville. So this picked, this created a very grim picture of what happened to Flora Bell based on her behavior at our school. So I thought this would be a good time for discussion uh, to see how uh, people, where people side on this. I did create a little poll for you to fill out. So, okay. um, Let's see if you can see where that is. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Can everyone see the poll? Yeah, but how do we get to it? Um, 
Um, that's a good question. You let me, oh, hold on, let me disengage a security option. Whiteboards. Okay, can you do it now? Oh, people are getting to it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm the loser, so. Okay. So we have really several discussion points and you're all welcome to, to give your input on it. When I first looked at the story, I felt very, very sad for Flora Bell based on what happened to her after, um, after leaving school. Um, because, you know, Fausta has mentioned the grades, but the other things really would not have mattered today. That was more a tradition of a patriarchal society. But also looking at it, she was just randomly uh, picking up rides with strangers or letting strangers, the friends were letting strangers in the car. Um, and that seemed exceptional, exceptionally dangerous to me. <laughs> um, she didn't appear to be truthful either. So I don't know, does anyone else want to um, chime in? Do we know have an estimate of the percentage of students that were asked to go away? Or is it, do you think Floribel is like a huge anomaly? I have no idea. I mean, it would be difficult because uh, Erin and I were actually talking about a little bit uh, yesterday about getting her grades to see basically how long FERPA would be um, an issue. And any sort of conduct like that you know, if it made it to the, we would have to find it in the chancellor's papers, which means we would have to go through all of the chancellor's papers to basically find it. I don't know that any statistics were kept. Sean, um, this is on you, man. Statistics and university archives. <laughs> I expect a report by the end of business day. It's hard to feel, this is Kathleen, it's hard to feel sorry for Florbell when you know, Faust said that she he was going to give her a chance. And all she had to do, all she had to do was write a groveling letter. And she just couldn't do it. She couldn't, she could not take the responsibility. Um, she was going to put the blame on everybody else, including him, which was never a good idea, especially with Faust. And, um, and she, she, she blew her, her one chance. I mean, not only did she want back, but she wanted back on her terms. And that semester, she just, she we we've we've talked up here we were wondering if anybody else read that letter before she sent it i mean i can't imagine that anybody would have thought that that was a good idea her mother might though might have yeah her mother did her no favors i think i think she just was so excited to get out of new burn you know <laughs> she was just yeah. so, yeah, I think she was just so excited to get out of New Bern. Here she was in the great bustling metropolis of Greensboro, which it would have seemed like at the time compared to New Bern at the time. Um, and it was like, woo! Yeah, I definitely <laughs> agree with Charisse that the mother should have kept the letters in the family. You don't go airing the family's dirty laundry um to everyone in the state. And she really had the tone of not my angelic child. Um, I, I, it just made it sound like Floribel was never disciplined in her entire life. And um, I, I also feel like, you know, I kept, I kept thinking, well, how my mother would have reacted to this and how awful that would have been. <laughs> like, her mother did her no favors and in her treatment. I have not, you know, done faust stockholm syndrome but and you know i'm a i'm a old school feminist but oh my god they would drive me nuts <laughs> i don't think i could have handled the brinsons uh at all they definitely couldn't read the room i mean no. <laughs> faust is somebody that you really don't want to mess with and um and uh, they just they just didn't do too too well with them. But I, I do agree with with Sharice and everybody else that I mean, if they had just been discreet, they talk about discretion a lot. But if they just been discreet, 
you know, made up some sham excuse for her coming home and then um, to take care of her poor sickly mother. She might have done, but, you know, instead of just lo losing her reputation at the school, she wouldn't have lose, lost her reputation in the state, which is apparently what happened. She had to go to Florida to get a bow. Yeah. Anyone in the audience want to chime in? As y'all can see, we've given this a lot of thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some might say too much thought. <laughs> And Faust was a Alamance County boy, so it's not like he'd never met a good Southern Belle, I'm guessing. He went to Chapel Hill with a degree in philosophy, which uh, I'm guessing you would need to deal with Floribel, be philosophical. Oh, I think the problem is Faust had met a lot of young women like Floribel, and I'm sure there were a lot of women like that who attended. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he had to talk to a lot of, of those. I thought he was actually um, rather generous considering the mental portrait I have painted of him from other sources. Yeah. Oh, that's would... a good question. Was McKeever, McKeever more like, it's all good? Or would he have been horrified? I don't think he put up with much nonsense either. But Ooh. I think Lula would have intervened. <laughs> or not, or Mrs. Kirk, Miss Kirkland, the, the oh. social director. She would have nipped this in the bud. Those early faculty members would have nipped this in the bud. First time she was boisterous at dinner, she would have been, her, her ears would have been boxed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I'm kind of on the side that she was not treated unjustly by Faust and the SGA, but she definitely didn't deserve what happened to her afterwards because she she knew she was not behaving by the rules. And I mean, if she didn't learn discretion at this point in her life, she was, in a, I mean, I, I don't even know how she was going to survive into her later years. But she said in her letter, though, that she she did not equate herself with anybody who who would have been sent out, you know, sent down from school and that she never had done anything shameful. And I can just I just saw Faust's brain just clicking off right at that moment, you know, that she just basically was not going to have any blame for herself. And uh, she just wanted to move right along. Right. If she had written the letter, the letter taking any sort of accountability for her behavior, it'd be one thing. But she just did not. She was a victim of what was it? Indiscretion. She was a victim. Thoughtfulness and carelessness. She was just a victim. Yeah, I agree with with Sharice entirely. The letters that President Fowl sent were very gracious, and he sent. He took his time in answering the parents. He was very thorough in his answers. He, I think once he read Florabelle's letter, he just kind of cut that letter short. But I, he, Faust was a lot more patient in his letters than I would have been. Um, Same here. And it sounds like Florabelle would have just failed out, right? Even without the horrors of High Point. Well, and that's and going what he to... mentioned anyway. He was yeah, like, well, right. he's doing so badly in school. I mean, if she wasn't, you know, such a beast she would be out anyway because she just you know couldn't pass a class oh i, I don't know if something... she actually came to class <laughs> well, <I'm> trying. <laughs> i just found her friend anna clark uh -huh. anna clark turns out she married in uh july 1924 yeah, yeah. anna got a job as a stenographer or a secretary like immediately yeah. afterwards so she just took some training classes she... She married possibly the son of the Armstrong Grocery because she married a John Thomas Armstrong. Oh, wow. She Whoa. Did herself. Oh, that must have burned so much. <laughs> and Well, her mother probably didn't announce it to God. Never. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Well, thank y'all for, yes. for, for your responses. Yes. This has been Yeah, fun. Any, any other opinions um, or takeaways? Oh, I agree with you, Sharice. 
if it were about her getting her degree, she would have been grateful, but she had to do it on her own terms. So the poll results, if you can't see them, 11% um, say that Floribel was treated unjustly by Faust and 89% say she was she was not. 11% uh, say that she was treated unjustly by society and or un was not treated unjustly by society and 89% justice for Floribel. We'll get t-shirts later. Yeah. Okay, I hope everyone can start a hashtag campaign on X and and such. I want the, you know, trending. This could be a trending topic. Yes. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Um, as always, as we find uh, more scandals, we will um, be happy to share them with the library. Um, and thank you for joining us for this initial event for Archives Months, which is on the topic of scandals and calamitous events. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Bye. Thank y'all.